Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. This would be the time of the year. Where, what, are, what are we, two weeks from the walleye opener? And uh, we'd usually be saying, okay, anybody heard where the crappies are biting? Looking for a fishing tip, right? But what are we saying this year? Is the ice going to be off? Right, this is, this is crazy. And it, it's the time of year when we're, when we're getting fired up. And I don't know about your experience, but my experience is 
that when I ask someone if they know where the fish are biting, honestly, it's where the fish were biting, right? You ever done that? You got a hot tip and you go out to fish and you're all fired up and you're thinking, man, I thought, I thought that the bite was on here. I experienced a, a sense of, uh, what shall I say, a sense of humor as uh, I went up with uh, the Seaver clan, my uncles and cousins. My uncle Dean was great at putting together fishing trips when he was alive. And, and he, he put together a trip where we flew out of Nestor Falls, Ontario, after a nice couple days of, of fishing big northerns with spoons. And we got into a de Havilland uh, beaver, a, a float plane, and we headed north uh, up to a, a, a remote fishing outpost on a, on a lake up there. And it was my first time in, uh, in a bush plane like this, so I was very happy when we landed. And, and once we landed and that plane began to purr towards the dock, uh, there, was, there was a sign at the end of the dock that said, you should have been here yesterday. I love that guy. And, and so, by the way, we did catch some fish. But today, um, we are going to talk about um, something that people, I think, deal with right now, and that's a missed opportunity. Because we're texters, we have an acronym for everything, including missed opportunities. And actually, it's more than just an acronym that we text with. Apparently, it's a real struggle, right? The fear of missing out, or FOMO. And, and, uh, and so we're living in a time where there are so many things going on that we're, we're actually quite concerned about missing out on something, some of us. Well, this morning, we are going to think, we are going to remember a missed opportunity that was incredibly important as a teaching moment in the ministry of Jesus. We are going to follow up the, the, uh, the story that we talked about last week when Jesus appeared to his disciples on the night of the resurrection and revealed that he was alive. Amazing. I mean, they were overjoyed. When Jesus said, peace be with you, he, he showed them his hands and his side. Do you understand the connection between the wounds on Jesus' hand and his side and peace? Powerful connection. The wounds of Jesus are an eternal reminder of the source of our peace. Jesus gave his life so you as a believer never, never need to doubt that it is possible that your sins can be forgiven. Jesus took care of that for you. Peace be with you, Jesus said. A wonderful peace that's not dependent on the circumstances going around us. Oh, can we be grateful for that? That evening, that first evening, of course, there was a stir in the city. Jesus had been crucified. The religious leaders were wringing their hands. They had sent a guard to the tomb. The danger was not over. But behind locked doors, Jesus came and he said, peace be with you. And 10 of his disciples were there to hear it. And they're overjoyed. And you're doing the math. Say, 10 of their, his disciples? I thought he had 12. Well, we know what happened to Judas, tragically. He was gone. But where was the 11th? This is the story of believing Thomas. Today, we are going to visit the story of believing Thomas. And I hope you're encouraged. We find it in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 24, reading in Jesus' name. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means he was a twin, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Through the doors, Although the doors were locked, Thomas came and stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. I'm sorry, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Thomas was not in a peaceful place. <laughs> then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. 
Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus loved Thomas. Thomas loved Jesus. But right now at this moment in their story together, Thomas was in the thick of a full-on faith crisis. There's so much more that we would often, uh, or I often wish I knew about a story, an event, an episode in, 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 in these moments when Jesus was here. H- haven't you wondered, like, where was Thomas? Why wasn't he with the other disciples? We aren't told. We aren't told if he was with his twin brother. We aren't told if he was so overcome with grief that he was not looking forward to being with the others. He wanted to process this on his own. We don't know if he ran into a squad of Roman soldiers on the way to this secret upper room where they were, the rest of them were locked away. We don't know. I guess we don't need to know. I'm so glad God tells us everything we need to know for life and salvation. I tell you what, I got a lot of other things that I want to know, right? I guess that's what heaven's for. We'll find out then. But we know this, that Thomas was in a really, really difficult place. Thomas was struggling with doubt. And if you've had a a bout of doubt in your life, maybe you're in the midst of one now. Maybe this isn't the most... um, Maybe this isn't the best time in your life in terms of your walk with God. How does God deal with us when we're in a faith crisis? This is a wonderful reminder of how God deals with us when we're in a faith crisis. The disciples had told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side... Not I cannot believe, but I what? I will not believe. Let's not be real rough on Thomas here, you guys. This story is not to shame Thomas. This story is to encourage us and give us hope. We are vulnerable people when we're in the middle of a doubt storm. I can just, can I be honest with you? We confessed the Christian faith when little Madison was was just baptized. Congratulations, by the way. (laughs) Not that long ago, I stood in my kitchen and I confessed the Apostles' Creed. There's something about reminding ourselves of who we are and what we believe and how central Jesus is to our lives that we need, especially during times of uncertainty. I stood with my hands on the counter and I said, I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son. I believe in the Holy Spirit because the enemy's messing with us all the time. And Thomas was vulnerable. He was in a place of unbelief. By the way, this is another reminder that the resurrection of Jesus was a supernatural event that even his closest friends who had been told on a number of occasions that this would happen, this was not gullibly expected or believed by them. Jesus had to appear to them in his resurrection glory because human beings that die and are cold and in the grave for three days don't come back to life unless God intervenes in an incredibly supernatural way, which he did, which he did with Jesus. Must have been a long week for Thomas, huh? How did he spend that week? I don't know. Was he in their company? We know by the end of the week he was, he was back with them. But Jesus was thinking about him. Jesus was aware of his friend. Okay, another confession. Well, then why didn't he come sooner? Why did he leave Thomas that whole week to wrestle with his 
difficult time in his life. You know what this reminds me of a little bit? There's a story earlier in the Gospel of John, actually a couple other stories in the Gospel of John where we, where we meet, meet Thomas. In, in John chapter 11, uh, Jesus hears word that one of his really close friends named Lazarus is really sick. He's good friends with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. They send word for Jesus because they have faith that if Jesus shows up, all will be well because Jesus could heal the brother's sickness. We know this story. Now, but this is the part that's interesting. Jesus didn't go right away to Bethany to be with his friends. He waited a while, and in the process, Lazarus died. Lazarus died. Jesus says to his friends, okay, let's go. We're going to Bethany. And Lazarus is sleeping, Jesus said, and we're going to go there and wake him up. (laughs) He's dead. You know what Thomas said? They knew how dangerous it was to be close to Jerusalem at this time. Bethany is just kind of like a bedroom suburb of Jerusalem. Thomas said, let's go and die with Jesus. Let's go and die with him. Thomas was loyal to Jesus. Thomas was loyal to Jesus. But that time of waiting in the story of Lazarus was incredibly important because God was going to reveal his glory eventually in God's time, not Mary and Martha's time. In God's time, this can be really hard. I read uh, just recently something about God's timing. It's, it, it, it reminded me that, that God is seldom in a hurry. Have you noticed in your prayer life? God is seldom in a hurry, but he's never late. God is seldom in a hurry, but he's never late. God's timing is perfect. It's different than our timing. Now here in a little later, we run into Thomas again as things are really kind of heading toward the big culmination. As, as Jesus is now having this last conversation with his disciples, he's told them clearly about what's going to happen, specifically, graphically. He told them, and, and it's no wonder that when we get to John chapter 14, Jesus looks at his friends and he says, you guys, that's a loose translation. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled, okay? Okay. You believe in God. You believe in me. Oh, it is such an important gift to be reminded what we believe and who we believe, especially under the stress like they were feeling that night. I'm going to prepare a place for you, he said. And in my father's house, there's lots of rooms, okay? I'm going there, and I will return and take you to be with me. So you can be where I am. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And you know the way. Thomas speaks in that story too. He said, Master, we don't know where you're going. (laughs) So how do we know the way? And that moment, Thomas set up for one of the most uh, reassuring uh, comments that Jesus made. We get a lot of mileage out of what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, Thomas. You know the way, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because we we hear these words from honest Thomas who who couldn't understand, so he told Jesus. And I'm sure the other disciple says, whoo, I was thinking the same thing. I'm sure glad Thomas asked. How are we going to know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I say this because this, as as we're in the upper room now and Thomas is in the middle of his faith crisis, he's having an incredible time. Jesus shows up not to shame Thomas, but because he loves Thomas. He's going to do something really important to bless Thomas. And I hope you're as encouraged as I am. My walk with Jesus isn't perfect. Is yours? Do you go through moments when you have a little struggle or storm? Where's Jesus when we're in those moments when we aren't what we'd like to be in relationship to him? Thomas said, I will not believe unless I put my finger 
in his hands and put my hand in his side. Yeah, that's pretty intense, wouldn't you say? <laughs> then Jesus shows up. I love it what he, when he, what he says to them. Doors were still locked. There was still reason to be concerned. It's not like just because Jesus is back, everything is fine. Those of you that are walking with Jesus realize walking with Jesus does not mean everything else is fine. Sometimes it's harder because you're walking with Jesus, but they're there, and, and, and Jesus says to them, like he needs to say to us again and again, how many times do you need to hear Jesus say, hey, Jeff, peace, peace be with you. It's going to be okay. Peace isn't the absence of things that could cause us to worry. It's the settled sense that we're friends with God. God is our friend. And because of that, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Peace be with you, Jesus says. And then he turns to Thomas and says, put your finger here. Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Okay, maybe you think this way too. I wonder what the tone of Jesus' voice was when he said, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Were those tender words? Were there firm words? I know this. If Thomas needed a firm word, it was firm. <laughs> If Thomas in his brokenness needed tenderness, it was tender. But it, it's not so much the tone of Jesus' voice, but the power of what Jesus said. First of all, why did he talk about his hands in his side? Because Jesus knew every moment of Thomas's faith struggle. He knew what Thomas said to his buddies when, he, when they were saying, Thomas, come on, we're not lying to you. Are we, Peter? Are we, Andrew? Are we, James? We're telling the truth. He's alive. And Thomas says, unless I touch his hand, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Jesus was listening. This is not to shame Thomas. No. Jesus listens to every thought I had last week. Is that good? Well, he listened to yours too. Is that good? Well, I'll tell you what, it's awesome. Because you live in the light as a child of God. You never have to wonder, well, if he really knew me, he does really know, know you. And you know what? He loves you more than you know anyway, even with your stuff. He died for your stuff. He died for your stuff. And there's something so life-giving to just be with him with your stuff. There's Thomas. Jesus knows. And what does Thomas do? Oh, he blesses his friend. He blesses him with the power of his word. The same word that said eons before, let there be light, and there was white light. That's a very powerful word, right? The same word that said at Bethany, after Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, Lazarus, come out. Pretty powerful word, because you know what? Lazarus came out. Yeah. So when he says to Thomas, stop doubting. Believe. That word has power to banish doubt, that word has power to call forth faith. That's what God's word does for us. That's what, happen when, that's what happens when God speaks. Thomas, the believer, believing Thomas now says, my Lord and my God. Thomas's faith crisis did not define him. Honestly, how many of you are as guilty as I am in looking back, and when you think of this guy, you call him what? Doubting Thomas. Nah, that didn't define his relationship with Jesus. And by God's grace, your struggles don't define you either. Your relationship with Jesus defines you. And that's a wonderful relationship. 
And the more central it is in my life, even if I have to stand in the kitchen and remind myself of what I believe, the more central it is in our lives. The more we live in that peace, the more we have a sense that all is well, even when things around us aren't. Stop doubting and believe. Doubt is an awful thing. Doubt kind of clouds the awareness of all the, all the good and great things about our Lord. Doubt kind of just kind of messes with those. I'm so glad that God sees that problem in my life with as much concern as a cancer diagnosis. Doubt is really hard on us. And Jesus knew that. So he came to his friend to do two things, to dispel his doubt and to speak faith into his life. Oh, what a wonderful Savior. And his word had power. Let there be light. And there was light. Lazarus, come out of there. And he came out alive. Stop doubting and believe. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God, he believed. If we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. All is well now between Thomas and God. Then Jesus said this. And I don't think, I, I'm convinced he did not say this to shame Thomas. I think he said it to encourage you and encourage me. I know God has interesting ways that he gets our attention. You may have had dreams and visions where you've seen a Jesus, however he came to you. That's not been my case, but I'm respectfully not going to, um, I'm not going to doubt or belittle those that have had some powerful God moments in their lives, right? I haven't seen Jesus. Maybe you haven't either. But I believe. Do you believe? There's a blessing for us here. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Is that you? God has a blessing for you. Even though you haven't seen him, one day you will see him. It's going to be awesome. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us. Maybe this is a little, I hope this is helpful. Have you seen the children's books? They're typically kind of the, the um, cardboardy, hard kind. And on the back cover, inside the back cover, there's a mirror. Have you seen these? And on each page, the center, there's an opening in the center of the page, right? So, so when you sit down with your child or your grandchild and you go through this book, as they're looking at the book, whose face are they seeing in the center of every page? Their face. You guys, we're in this story. Jesus was thinking about the power of the gospel. He was, gonna think, he was thinking about the powerful ministry that Thomas would have. As he took the gospel east, we believe that Thomas, Thomas was, was vital in bringing the gospel to India. Think of the millions of people on God's heart in India. Thomas got to plant the first seeds. Because blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. This word would go forth, and this word is powerful. It's the word of God, and it creates faith and protects faith. So we're going to just uh, be reminded that it's normal to believe in something we haven't seen as we wrap this up. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 is this wonderful summary of people who walked with God before Jesus came, all right? And, and it goes through all these heroes of the faith from Abraham and Moses and Gideon and, and, uh, and, and David. And, and what they all had in common was that they were living towards a future that they never fully experienced. They were heading for a city whose architect and builder was God. And they did this not seeing it, but believing it. And we're told in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. 
That's faith. That's faith. God has revealed himself to you with the good news of what Jesus has done, and he has loaded that with promises. The Christian life is a promise-driven life. Faith is trusting that God does and will keep his word. As we read this morning, uh, thank you for reading that, Carissa. Though you don't Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him, now you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. God chose to reveal himself in the physical human person of Jesus. In his resurrected glory, the largest gathering was 500. When you look at the Christians on the globe right now, that's not very many. God had a way that he was going to save people. And it wasn't Jesus popping up like a jack-in-the-box all over. As a kid, honestly, I don't know what kind of prayers you prayed as a kid. I prayed this one. Jesus, if you're real, appear in my room. He didn't. He's still real. He's still real. And he still comes to us, but he comes to us in his word. At the end of John, uh, this chapter in John 20, after after, uh, Jesus talked about us, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us, all who believe. All who believe. After talking about us, then John talks to us. It's, it's kind of like, and again, I hope this is helpful and not unhelpful, but if you ever watch The Office, you're saying, how can this be helpful? Anyway, if you've ever watched The Office, there are those moments when the people are involved in the show, instead of being involved in the narrative, they talk to you as the viewer. You know what I'm talking about? When they pull them aside and they talk to you. Well, this is what this feels like here because John's been telling us the narrative of Jesus and quoting Jesus and describing what Jesus did. And it's like he stops now at verse 30 and he says this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Oh, what a gift it is to believe. To know God as your heavenly Father, to know the one who created you, to know the one who spared nothing, to get rid of that barrier between you and him we call sin, And the one who took it upon himself to do that. And the one that now calls you to trust him with your life. And not deceiving you into thinking that it's going to be an easy life. But promising that it's going to be a meaningful life. And it's going to be an eternal life. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the gift of your word, which points us to the greater gift, which is Jesus, which points us to the wonder of your great love for us. Father, you know our struggles with doubt. You know our seasons of doubt. And we thank you that you still speak into our doubt. Would you make us hungry for your word? Would you make us eager to be with our brothers and sisters and hear your word together that we might look around at one another and say, we're not crazy. This is true. I believe it. Do you believe it? Yes, I believe it. We thank you that we're called to be the company of the believing. We thank you that you don't define us by our moments of struggle, by our seasons of doubt, We thank you that you come to us with your word. May we turn and come to you gladly. We thank you that you still are pursuing us with your love. You are honoring your word. 
And you are preparing us for a time when we'll stand in the presence of the one, when we will see you. Until that time, strengthen our faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Doug, and I want to take a minute and, and say thank you for watching the worship service today. If you'd like to extend your time of worship, we have a couple links to worship songs that fit today's message in the description down below. You simply click, and you can spend more time with Jesus in your day today. I have three quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and it'll only take a minute. First, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd be willing, you can visit our website at triumphlbc.org connect and let us know how we can reach you. Or you can visit triumphlbc.org events to find an activity that you could jump into. Second, we hope that you see this content as a supplement to your walk with Jesus. Our digital content really isn't designed to replace belonging and engaging with a gospel community. So whether that's here at Triumph or at another church, we invite you to find a community that you can connect with. And third, we invest a lot of resources into producing content that's used to bless people just like you all over our community. If this or any of the other resources we have here at Triumph have blessed you, would, would you consider giving? It's because of your generosity that we are able to continue creating and serving online.